welcome back to our crime stories and what has been a while. I have given birth to my twin boys, Ezra and Rue. They were born on the 28th of August. So that's why the crime stories have not been on. Um, we are back to normal now. I'm still in mat leave, but I plan on bringing out some crime stories maybe every third or fourth week. So remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel because you'll get a notification when these videos have been uploaded. Now, the case I'm focusing on today is The Watcher. It's a very relevant case at the moment through Netflix. And I decided to do this case to separate the fact and the fiction of the case. And I think you'll actually find that the fact of the case is a lot more interesting. But you'll also realise within the documentary in the Netflix series, that there's actually two crime stories in one. They don't abbreviate on the second part, but I thought it'd be very interesting and fun to do today to give us a wee bit more knowledge on not just the characters of the series, but the reality of what actually happened and how it's been dramatised and give us a better idea and hopefully we create a better ending than the actual Netflix series. There was a lot of talk around the ending of the Netflix series. People were disappointed. Um, when I popped the post up on our Facebook and Instagram, a lot of people said they enjoyed it, but some people said they hadn't enjoyed it because of the ending. What we need to remember is this is an unsolved crime, so there isn't really an ending. So again, Netflix have dramatised it and left it as a cliffhanger, likely for the reason so they can bring out another series. I will be watching it. I did enjoy it, um, it's just my opinion, but I did actually thoroughly enjoy the series. Um, but reading the case after watching it and doing my homework on it, I found it very interesting to what parts have dramatised. But what I do believe as well is that not just Netflix, but the family that sold the rights to this to Netflix had their own perception of who they thought that was and I feel that was carried out within the film as we know. Now again it's a spoiler alert so just be very careful if you've not watched it um, but if you're looking for the true facts of the case then stick with us. So let's get started. The Watcher, 657 Boulevard, Westfield, New Jersey is where this took place. Now the Broadus family bought their dream home in 2014 for 1.4 million. They'd worked hard to get this, but prior to moving in, they'd received an anonymous letter. Now, the letter basically said that someone had been watching them and that someone had watched the house for a lot of years. Now, the very first letter read was, 657 Boulevard has been the subject of our family for years and it approaches its 110th birthday. And waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched in the 1920s and my father watched in the 1960s. Now, I think that creates a timeline. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. That was a portion of the letter. Now, that letter wasn't written. That was a type letter, as you'll know if you've already watched the series. Now, this was prior um, to the family moving in. Now the family who actually bought the house were, were Derek and Maria Brodus. Now they had three young children as well. The letter had said that someone obviously had been watching the house for years but also the letter was addressed to the new owner. So at that point whoever this watcher was certainly didn't know what the owner's name was. Now the typed letter was one of four and they were always signed the watcher. Now, over time, the family said that the letters got increasingly worse and it also proved that they were monitoring the family. So they were making references to the children, to the children's name, which I'm going to put the letters in and we'll go through them one by one. But again, the very first letter was prior to them moving in. Now, if you remember in the Netflix series, <coughs> they've moved in or they're moving in when they received this letter, whether in reality that wasn't the case. Um, from the day they got the keys and he checked the mailbox, the letter was there. As you can see a part of the letter there, what I'm going to do now though is pop up some of the other statements within other letters just to give you an idea of what type of letters the family were receiving or they were saying that they were receiving. So you will be able to see in the very last photograph that the surname was spelt wrong. Now that wasn't the letter one, so at this point they obviously knew the surname. 
and they'd spelt it wrong, that would tell me that's someone who's not very computer savvy or they only have snippets of information because if they had the right information, surely the first thing they would know would be the spelling of the surname. So I think that's a telltale sign. Now, in the series, the family move into the home and keep receiving these letters and things like that. But in reality, the broadest family never moved into 657 Boulevard. What actually happened was when they received their first letter, it unnerved them. When they received the second letter, they were speaking directly about the children asking did the children want to come to the basement nobody would hear them screaming he referred to the children as young blood he also said in one of the letters that the woods family he had asked them for young blood and he had asked them to move out now the woods the woods family was a family who'd owned 657 Boulevard for 23 years and they had sold it on now they said they never had received any letters the full time that they were there but also just before they were moving out, they received a letter as well, but they just disregarded of it. I did try and look for some sort of evidence around that letter, but I can't find it. The Woods family said they'd never had any problems within the home in the 23 years that they were there, but what they did say was, again, they'd received this letter. Now, they hadn't spoke up or said anything. I don't think they'd thought much of it, but it got me thinking. So the house was built in the 1920s, so in one of the letters, he says the three families that were here were all brought by greed. So that would tell me he comes from the fourth family. So I did try and do my homework to do the sales on the house. And the sales only run up to the 1990 when you see the Woods bought the house for 365000 Sold it for $1.4 million. Um, <laughs> but before that, I couldn't see nothing at all until I'd done some further homework to when the house was built and the person that built the house. Now the person that built the house also had one term as a mayor in Westfield as well. So the very first family that lived in 657 Boulevard was the Davis family. And as I said, he was a mayor from one term in Westfield. It doesn't say when the house changed hands, but if you remember rightly, it said in one of the letters, my grandfather watched the house, my father watched the house in the 60s, and now it's my turn to watch the house. So that tells me if his father watched the house in the 60s, maybe his father was born in the late 40s. So it's gaining a timeline like that. What I do think with this, even on a psychic side of things as well, I don't. I think it's owner's number two, which is hard to locate at the moment. Um, I've had a wee look online, I cannot find it anywhere, but we have the Davis for family one and we have the Woods for family three and also the new family four would have been the Broadduses. So it sounds really silly, but I feel the family number two could be very much connected around this. Now, also in the series, they have the neighbours, Mitch and Mo. In the series, they are sitting out in the front garden on their loungers, watching directly to the house, being very obvious about it, not subtle, um, very, very strange characters within the series. But what actually happened, there is a bit of fact in that in reality in it. A man, Bill Woodward, who was a Broadduses house painter, said that the neighbours behind 657 Boulevard, one day he was painting, when he looked out the window, they were sitting in the chair facing the home and just being very, very odd about it. Now, obviously, he didn't report it, he didn't think anything of it, he probably thought it was just nosy neighbours, but that's why that has came into the series, was down to the account that Bill Woodward had given. Again, it's public knowledge now, the neighbours are not happy with how this has been perceived in Netflix. I don't blame them, to be totally honest. Maybe they were just nosy neighbours and watching the construction people. You never know. Now, the police, the FBI, detectives have all investigated this at one point or another. They've had DNA experts, handwriting experts in as well. But again, no leads. They've even asked all the neighbours, did DNA through them, and nothing's came back with that. So again, it's probably a reason why the neighbours are so annoyed about this because they've already cleared their names, whether now Netflix has been brought back up again. I think it would be easy to think that it was the neighbours, but then it still could be the neighbours. Maybe they've not questioned the right neighbour. Now, from looking at this case straight away, I wanted to have a look at the street and because it was 1.4 million, this must be a, an amazing street and amazing homes and things like that. But what I did find went onto Google Maps and it's worth having a look yourselves. Um, just type in 657 Boulevard into Google and go to street, map, street View. It's not that it's not a nice house, but it's not the nicest house in the street. So that would tell me it's obviously sentiment that's connected around this, whether to this watcher, um, rather than 
that's the house like an outbid because obviously the house was on the market they got it for 1.4 million so a lot of people were seeing within the series could it be someone who was outbid that's trying to scare them back out the home i don't think that's the case i think it's sentiment connected to it just again and it's just more of a visual thing but the street view said it for me that there's so many lovely houses in that street they could have picked any house the watcher did also say that he had been watching the house for two decades so again it begs the question of why and i keep saying he all right i don't know if it is a he or a she um i'm psychically get that it's a he but i think what changed with the woods moving why did they prefer for that family to live there and they had no problems whatsoever it has been said as well that the Broadduses could be cashing in and they couldn't afford the house. They may be a bit off more than they could chew when it came to the financial side of things. I don't agree with that. I feel this has happened. But what I do think is the Broadduses have cashed in on it. I don't blame them. If they're in that situation and someone wants to carry that story, then so be it. Um, but I do think that, again, that clouds a lot of people's judgment on it. The Broadduses still continued to renovate the home for the first six months, although they didn't live in the home and eventually decided to sell. But what actually happened was that they decided to disclose the letters because they didn't want someone in the same position as their sales because I think they were a little bit annoyed that the Woods hadn't disclosed that they'd received this letter, which I think the Woods just didn't think anything of it. When they tried to sell, it was decided by the real estate that they would disclose the letters. So if they were putting in an offer, they were then given all the information and were allowed to see these letters to see if they were happy enough and as obvious as it was as soon as they seen the letters they pulled out the sale and the sale never went through so it was becoming harder for the Broadduses to get rid of the house as well right so here comes the curveball and the second part of again another crime story in effect there is a character in the series called John Graff now he comes into it and in the series he lived in 657 Boulevard before the current family and he had murdered all his family and the neighbours holding him at her house and he's watching the house and the series. In actual fact, John Graff is based on a true story crime, a true character, which his name was actually John List. John List also came from Westfield, but he actually lived two miles away from 657 Boulevard. He lived in a 19 bed mansion and he'd actually worked for the bank and lost his job, hadn't told his family, he lived with his wife, his mother and his three children. He was using his mum's money um, to pay the bills every month, but again, she was unaware. He was very disapproving of his children and the generation they were in, his daughter having boyfriends or anything that wasn't moral within the church. Now, what he actually did was, he sent his children out to school one day, went into his house, went up the stair and shot his mum then went down the stairs and shot his wife. He then went and picked up his children from school, went to one of his children's basketball games, brought them home and shot them one by one. Now they all had one gunshot wound, apart from his middle child, which was John, who had 10 gunshots. It's obviously apparent that John had struggled. Now he was 15, his daughter was 16 and the other boy was 13. And what he did was, once he'd shot them, he took all their bodies into the ballroom of his home and lined them up together, put them in sleeping bags and left his mum on the second floor in the hallway and put on orchestra music, some sort of classical music, like funeral music, put all the lights on in the house. Now he then went and had a sandwich and sat around these bodies until later on that day, he then left, dropped his car at the airport. And again, no one ever knew at this point this had even happened. It took a month for police to find the bodies. And it was only because his lights were on every single night that the neighbors were starting to think it was strange. But also the daughter had confided in the drama teacher at school. She had told her drama teacher that at dinner one evening, her dad had asked, would she like to be buried or cremated? And he'd asked the full table and that she was worried her dad was going to harm them or do something to them. It was later found out that John List had actually phoned the children's school the week before to tell them that the children were going away to visit family for a little while and they wouldn't be at school. Now, the daughter had a drama show, so the drama teacher knew that she would never miss that show. So again, he raised the alarm to say why she hadn't turned up. And from then on, obviously the lights were on and this is how they found the children's body and his wife and his mother.
Do you imagine being the police walking into that situation after a month to a big scary mansion and when you walk in there's music playing to walk in and find three bodies lined up together and as I said his mother was left on the second floor. John left a letter admitting why he had done it and said that he didn't want to go on welfare which again could be like universal credit in the UK or something like that. He was too proud a man and didn't want to put his family through it. But my suspicion on this is there is a story that the daughter was having some sort of relationship with the drama teacher and that John had found out. Now, also, it said that there's a chance the drama teacher actually went to the house before the police knew and possibly found the bodies and that's why he raised the alarm. I don't know what truth, truth is in that, but I do believe it was something like that that knocked him before the financial side. Um, when I was doing the case, it was one of the first things that I Bearing in mind, John had fled the month before. He'd left his car at the airport. The time the police went on his tracks, it was far too late. He literally went missing for 18 years and started a new life in Virginia, remarried, and changed his name to Robert Clark, or is known as Bob Clark. Now, he got away with this for 18 years until America's Most Wanted had put a thing up for him, and they brought in calls, but also he'd had his fingerprints taken a week before the murders because he'd applied to get a gun. So what they did was they checked the fingerprints, and when they checked the fingerprints, although he was Robert Clark, it brought it back to John List and that's how he was found out and he still denied it. Um, and in the end, he got a life sentence for it, but it took 18 years to locate him. Having a look at Westfield, where all this is taking place, whether it be the John List or the Watcher, the house prices are sky high, but the crime rate's even higher and it's unsolved murders, people going missing, never been found. And um, there was even one, there was a wee baby found dead as well and that was unsolved. and. It's different counties of police, but it makes you wonder, like the house price there, like how high it is to what the crime rate is as well. A lot of this was in the 1970s, the 1980s and 1990s. But again, it's one of those towns that's always been at the forefront and the crimes seem very, very horrific. So again, with The Watcher, I could understand why people would be unnerved um, if you were buying a house and then this type of thing happened. But also, is it someone going in the back of why Westfield's known as being quite creepy in that sense as well. Now back to the Broadduses, they were struggling to sell the property because they had disclosed this information. At this point the media was starting to pick up on it as well. And what they actually decided to do was rent the property out. Now I can't find the letter for this, but what had actually happened was the rental who had came in was a man and a woman and their grown up children and two big dogs. And they literally received a letter within the first few months he'd been there that basically said about Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. Now, it doesn't really abbreviate much more than that, but then the renters moved out as well. Eventually, the, ho the house was sold in 2019. It was sold for 945,000, so they took quite a dip um, in what they were making, and it was obviously because at this point they were trying to get rid of it. And again, people were just put off because they had disclosed around the letters, but they didn't want people to be in the same boat as themselves. It's a bit like the watcher was annoyed that they hadn't, the Broadduses hadn't moved in. When they sold in 2019, the new owners were Andrew and Alison Carr. Now, until date, they said they'd never received any letters, nothing had happened untoward around them. But then they found reports that get put out and leaked onto the internet. That the police have actually visited the house on multiple occasions. Now it did say 58 times, but I couldn't find 58 times, but it was for the alarm going off in the basement a good few times. So the basement seems to be quite a attraction within the series, but also in reality as well. The police denied it, but eventually the reports came out where they couldn't deny it. So they said they've had a lot of call outs from the new owners as well, Andrew and Alison Carr. I don't know what truth's in that, but it was reported within the media in the last few so In October 2021, the police said there'd been no communication or threatening letters to the new owners. However, files exclusively obtained said otherwise. Possibly burglars from the home basement. Does that sound familiar to the series? Um, May 2021, police visited the property, alarm going off in the basement. They then were back on the 27th of January again, a medical call, um, but it doesn't say what the call was for, but also on the 10th of December, the alarm went off in 2021. So again, alarms could go off. The difference is now from when this happened in 2014, 
we are all much more CCTV savvy, so there's cameras now, and it would make it a lot harder for someone to do that. But if you look at the, the actual home, it doesn't have a mailbox anymore. It is a very interesting case, but again, a lot of people have already mentioned the ending, that it's a bit of a cliffhanger. I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of the watcher. What I do think though is that it is someone who is very much connected to the house, but I don't feel they lived in the house. I feel possibly family connected, hence family too. Um, and I feel it's a man within his late forties and he's very bitter in himself around something to do with inheritance some money. Now, I don't know if that house was sold and that's why I need to know this. For family too, where someone missed out on something, the name James connects around, connects around something to do with it as well. What I do think is around the neighbours that they were very nosy, but I do feel, as I said in earlier in the video, I feel it was just neighbours watching construction. Maybe odd neighbours, some people might say, but again, it's just that there may be people watchers. I believe the person that is doing it lives about two or three streets away. I don't feel they're completely in vision, but what I do feel is that they'd be more fascinated with the house and the families that's lived in that house. I want to see the previous family I get psychically accepted them and acknowledged them without realising. So that tells me that's someone that has been speaking to them. Um, as I said, I don't think this person will get caught, but I do feel this person runs a narrative in media and social media. So the heightening of the Netflix is something that's feeding into this person's personality. Where I think between now and April, we're going to hear a lot more about this, but I feel it's going to become more and more far-fetched. And it's only because this person in particular is running on the narrative of the media. I feel it's feeding someone's personality where they're feeling a bit more powerful around something. What I do get as well is that there was some sort of end of life in that home when I look at it. But I feel it was, again, something to do with family too. And I feel two ladies involved around that as well, the name Victoria around something. So I'm just going to put it out in the video because you never know how things change. Later on, we'll end up with some sort of validations. I'm not going to do the spirit box with this case just for the fact that there's nothing really to go on in the spirit side of things. What I will say though is, since I've been doing this case, there's been <laughs> silly wee things happening to me. So I do feel that house is haunted. I do feel there's a lot of energy connected to it. And I want to say it's easy to say the basement's scary. And I think if anything, the watcher needs to think more outside the box. I have thoroughly enjoyed doing this case. As I said, I enjoyed watching it on Netflix. I enjoyed doing the homework where it just shows you it's not always as it seems to how dramatised it is. Again, I don't think we'll ever know who the watcher is. I can imagine there'll be another series out at some point, the way they've left it too. So I think it's a good starting point for a good, again, film, horror film, things like that in a series. It's something I'll definitely watch, but I don't think it's anything as serious as what it's been made out. I could be wrong, but I really, truly, truly believe that if we spoke more about the actual house, there'd be more story around that, because I feel, if anything, there's more ghostly activity going on in there, but it's overshadowed the letters and things like that. Um, yeah, and the name James around it, so we'll just need to keep it. I really hope you've enjoyed this case. Um, again, thank you so much for watching. Remember and subscribe and hit the bell so you get a notification when our next crime story goes up. I also use my channel for vlogging with the boys as well. So if you want to see the twins, they'll be on YouTube pretty soon. I've not added the videos, but I will very soon. Um, just remember and subscribe. I don't know what the next case will be, but I will have a wee look. I'm possibly going to look into the New Jersey Unsolved Murders because I think that would be very interesting. But please, again, subscribe, comment, like. Check us out over on Facebook and Instagram. But yeah, my psychic vibe in this is, yeah, it's someone playing funny buggers. It didn't happen to 2014. And just before that, family moved out. And I think that was just setting the tone. Um, but I do feel it's a 40 plus man, the name James connected around it. And I don't feel he gets out a lot. He keeps talking about something to do with his mouth as well. Or someone keeps saying about his mouth. We'll keep it. Stay safe, take care. See you all again soon. Sleep well.